I ask of you, the audience, to envision a gift. It may have a big bow on top or be pristinely wrapped. The size does not necessarily matter. It could be large or small. Perhaps it looks something like this or along these lines. Now that you have this image in your mind and on the screen, you're probably wondering what is inside of this random box. But before I tell you what is actually inside, I'm going to give you a few hints. First off, it's not the Game Boy you asked for when you were eight years old. And well, it can't be purchased on Amazon, so it most definitely does not qualify for Amazon Prime. And lastly, well, there is no return to sender option. However, it is a gift of impact. It is not a gift I would ever expect anyone else to want. In fact, I didn't want it at first either, but I've come to love it for everything that it is worth. I call it my gift of impact because it has led me to some of the greatest successes and realizations in my career thus far. Successes that now act as a light at the end of the tunnel in my constantly changing life. These gifts look something like this, completely obliterated cartilage in both my hip joints, much of which I don't have anymore, and this, Severely antiverted femurs. Basically, for the first 16 years of my life, my legs did not sit straight in my body. And this, femoroacetabular impingement. Gross on both my hip joints that restricted my femurs from moving properly in my body, therefore affecting my gait. And lastly, this, a genetic disorder by the name of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. These gifts soon turned into this, and this, and an array of pretty awesome scars, but I didn't always view them that way. Nowadays, we ask research scientists and physicians about that light bulb moment when they realized they wanted to go into a STEM career. Some may say, well, when I was in seventh grade, my science teacher showed me a demonstration in class, and I became amazed by the reaction that occurred. But my story, well, it's a little bit different. You see, when I was a kid, and I mean even more of a kid than I am now, I loved science and engineering. I loved having my hands on things. But I was never able to find the motivation for the research that I found today. Everything in my childhood seemed pretty much normal. Despite the fact that kids at school made fun of me for the way I ran, I sort of just brushed that off my shoulder. Until one day when I was 13 years old and I was playing the game of lacrosse, a sport I had grown up playing. I was running straight down the field, about to shoot at the top right corner of the goal, when all of a sudden, my hips locked. And I immediately fell to the ground. I could not get up. I felt as if I needed some sort of key to unlock my hips a key I did not have at the time. Shortly after this, I found myself sitting in countless doctor's offices week after week, being forced to look at an abundance of CT scans, x-rays, MRIs, and even ultrasound studies. Copious amounts of information was being thrown at me, and in that moment, I decided I could look at my situation one way or another. I could either let all this confusing yet extremely interesting information go in one ear and out the other, or I could actually start listening and playing an active role in my health. I decided to stick with option two. Surgeries began quite promptly after this realization, and I found myself with a lot of free time in my hands. I mean, I was sitting in a hospital bed after all. I decided to put this free time to what I thought was good use. I began reading a plethora of orthopedic and biomedical engineering research journals, highlighting everything I understood in orange and everything I didn't understand in yellow. Turned out that most of those pages were covered in yellow. But I didn't let that discourage me. I mean, I had the resources after all. I, began, I became that overly annoying patient who asks way too many questions. But I think my doctors may thank me for it later. Early on in my high school career, I worked on the development of a two-part 3D printed implant to treat internal snapping hip syndrome in female adolescents. Now, that sounds like a mouthful, but I'll break it down for you. Basically, I focused my study on female adolescents not only because I was one myself, but because one, I was still in this phase in my life where I thought that being able to create an audible snap on command with my hips was something worth wanting to all of my friends and doctors. But more importantly, research had found that when female adolescents are going through puberty, their hips grow faster than the rest of their body. And then this iliopsoas or hip flexor tendon, which sits right about here on my hip joint, is then forced to span a greater surface area and becomes tight, inflamed, and then snaps. I realized that if I could find a way to relieve the stress of this iliopsoas off of those eminences, then I could ideally prevent the snapping. My research was actually quite successful. I computationally designed, tested, and 3D printed a two-part implant, 
one located at the pelvis and one located right below the greater trochanter around my hip joint. Now, like many gifts, mine always seems to keep on giving. After three years of treatment quite close to home, my doctors decided that Sophie Edelstein, the mystery case, was truly a mystery, and there was not much more they could do for me. But there was one place they had in mind, and it goes by the name of Boston Children's Hospital. At the time, I felt confused and terrified and quite frankly abandoned. I mean, I had never been given treatment out of the Yale network before. But I came to learn that Boston Children's Hospital was probably the best thing that would ever happen to me. I was getting the healthcare I needed, and I was getting this amazing support system in terms of research and mentorship. Being the science-minded kid I was, I had to do all of my research. I looked into the new doctors, new environment, and just about everything I was getting myself into, even if I generally didn't know at those points in time. During my excessive research, I came across an article in the New York Times titled, Doctors Experiment with New Ways of Fixing the ACL. In my mind, I thought, orthopedic, score. But it was even better when I came to realize that my own doctors were the ones behind this new treatment. The team at Boston Children's Hospital had identified that the ACL in the knee does not heal naturally due to a lack of blood supply in the area. That would inevitably send signals throughout the rest of the body to initiate regeneration. However, if you can find a way to stabilize the blood in the area, then a clot forms and those signals can be sent, therefore encouraging regeneration. I recognize that the same thing happens with the acetabular labrum in the hip joint. So if I could develop a scaffold with similar properties to that of the bridge enhanced ACL, then I and many others could avoid the countless labral repair surgeries and allow our bodies to do what they do best, which is of course heal. You see, we have blood, which is this great stimulant for healing, which comes straight from the patient's body. And then the scaffold that I worked on in the lab, which has the ability to hold the blood in the wound site, therefore activating the platelets, and then those two things together form a stable clot that solidifies, which has the ability to encourage cell ingrowth, proliferation, and even tissue healing. Now, my research as it is presented here sounds pretty much perfect, but I can assure you that it was far from that. I met a multitude of roadblocks along the way, and there were many times when I wanted to give up, just like many scientists would. But I had this false idea in my mind that if I gave up, well then, it was fair game for my doctors to give up on me, something I had always feared. But that is not my point here. My point is that I do not rate my success on the awards I've won at international science competitions for this research I just described, or even the fact that I'm standing talking to all of you right now. I rate my success on the feeling of walking out of the lab at the end of a long, tiring, and confusing day, and knowing that there are research scientists and physicians across the globe working on similar things as I am to better my life and the life of many others. If I can help out too, then why not? I've come to realize that there's a very, very close tie between my research and my health challenges. I know I will not be better tomorrow or next month or maybe even next year. But when is there a day when we walk into the lab and sit down at the bench and say, today I am going to cure colon cancer? We don't. It is simply impractical and irrational. We have been working on a cure for colon cancer for the last 10 to 15 years and still have not found it. But there will be a day when we do find it. Just like there will be a day where I will be able to walk up a single flight of stairs and not feel as if my legs are going to collapse from underneath me. It is research that will make that possible. It is research that has allowed me to stand on the stage for the last 10 minutes talking to all of you without needing my cane. It is research that brought tears to my eyes at the sight of two straight legs for the first time in my life. It is research that has allowed me to learn how to walk again. And it is research that has acted as that light at the end of the tunnel. You do not have to be a math or science genius to play an active role in your health. But if you find something you are confident about, it'll act as the force behind you towards your success, whether that be in developing a more positive or optimistic attitude. These gifts are not supposed to break you down. They are supposed to build you up, as cliche as that sounds. These gifts help me realize that I love science, and I love engineering, and I love helping people. At least, that's how I've managed to see it. Thank you very much.